being recorded. going to go ahead and get started. I know that there will be some additional um, people joining us, and then some will be listening to this recording later. So we want to um, go ahead and start. For those that are on the web, uh, we are here. The ARC um, is here in Nashville, Tennessee, uh, meeting with our advisory board. So we've actually got our stakeholders together, pulled together to think about the next year for the ARC. I am Candace Jones, and I am actually the Virginia State Coordinator for the ARC, and also the School Turnaround Liaison. And I'll be helping to facilitate today's session about best practices in engaging stakeholders in the design and implementation of new standards and assessments. That's a mouthful, but <laughs> we are excited about the panel that we have together today. We've got a mix of practitioners as well as researchers, and actually all of them have, have practical experience in the field that they bring to this work. And as we think about strategic communications for SEAs, this is, this is such a big topic right now, uh, particularly with the rollout of the new education regulations. Um, the Every Student Succeeds Act, or ESSA, as we'll be referring to it throughout today's session. So we are Excited about that rollout, and we know states are as well, but it also means that there may need to be some changes in their state standards at where they are now, and then thinking about what adjustments might need to be made, and same thing with assessments and accountability and on. And so as this rollout happens, how do we communicate with our stakeholders, with our schools, with our districts, with our parents and families, with the community, business leaders, Etc. And so we have three panelists today that will be uh, will be talking with us about their experience or about their research in this area. Um, first up, we are going to have uh, Dr. Heather Zavadsky, and she will be talking with us about a research paper that that she did that focused on five states and their communication practices, where she really broke down and looked at what were some of those best practices and what were some of the challenges in the strategic communications in those SEAs. One of those SEAs that she um, looked at is Kansas, actually, and we have a, a panelist who is the former commissioner of the State Department of Education in Kansas, um, Diane DeBacker. And she'll be talking from her experience as a commissioner and rolling out the Common Core Standards and challenges that were faced in, in that area so we can learn from that practical experience. And then our third panelist is Mike Martin, and he is with the Hunt Institute, and will be speaking from his research on, on the work in Kentucky and Tennessee uh, and their communications around Common Core and rolling out new standards and assessments. So we've got some great knowledge in the room, and we're really excited about that. For those who are on the web or on the phone, uh, you can Type in any questions that you have throughout our session today, and we'll be monitoring the chat and making sure that those questions are, are added in. Some of you sent questions in advance, and we thank you for that. And so what we'll do is we'll have each panelist will be speaking to us for about 10 minutes, um, give or take, and then we will have some facilitated discussion among them, and then we'll open it up for questions. So as you're listening to their presentations, feel free to write down any questions that you have. We'll get through all three of those, and then we'll, we'll open it up to, to the room here and to the web. Great. 
So I think we'll, we'll go ahead and get started with um, Dr. Zawadzki. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Heather, Heather Zawadzki. I'm from the Building State Capacity and Productivity Center. I'm excited to be here. Operate here. Oh, I can do that. Or right here. Oh, OK. Yeah. Do it right there. Everybody's welcome. That's me. <laughs> and that's me. <laughs> All right. Um, so I kind of wanted to start with a, being a little bit interactive just quickly. And yes, I had to get a picture of a, a political football. Because as, as you all know, state standards, you know, when we started out with Common Core, it used to be kind of OK. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> boom, it just became a big thing. Um, so when you're thinking about a state education agency and communicating about state standards, what what kind of purposes are you meeting when you're communicating about state standards as an SCA? Just yell out or type out, folks in the room here. What what does an SCA need to do when they're communicating about standards? Be clear. And they need to be clear. Reach multiple stakeholders. Multiple stakeholders. Education. education speak. So again, that clarity, avoiding jargon, those types of things. So the things I put here, so you want to inform stakeholders. You want them to understand the, the purpose behind the standards and why you're even making this change. You want to, within that SEA, connect and, and align the work with, within the SEA and all those different departments that typically are built originally in silos. You want to have communication alignment then with the LEA. You want to gain their support, um, especially with something like Common Core. As we know, most SDAs had to switch from using the word Common Core to X state standards because that word became so uh, such a problem. And then you want to inform or communicate about policy. You either want to inform policymakers to get their support or you've got policy that you are talking to your internal and your external stakeholders. So there's a whole lot of different communication purposes and a whole lot of levels there. So it becomes very complex. Um, so given that, who should drive that message? Who should vet it? Who should craft it? Um, you know, what, what vehicles do you put it out there? Is it, is it the top level SEA chief or superintendent? Um, would it be the academics department because it would fall logically under there? Is it the communication department because they're trained in communication and avoiding jargon and those types of things? Or is it government relations because we're talking about policy and needing support with stakeholders and having legislators support what the SEA is trying to accomplish? Or is it the legal department to try to look at that thing? Who, who should drive that process? So. That's one of the, the things that we were trying to get to at BSCP when we started our um, benchmarking project in communication. So um, just a, a quick bit about benchmarking um, is the idea that you are looking at the best type of model and the understanding that you can't necessarily or you won't necessarily find the best model in the area you're looking in. So if you're looking at the best type of school, you may not look in the same district. But you might find the best school in that district, but ideally if you could find the best school in one arena. So benchmarking looks at outside of industry sometimes to find the ideal type of model or target. And so um, we did that with this benchmarking, and I'll show you the model in a moment. We benchmarked last year we had uh, five states, and Kentucky was also involved, but then they, they pulled out, but they were involved with the, the pre-work and a lot of the work. And we had um, the Kentucky commissioner actually speak at a meeting last year. Those of you might have been there. And then this year, in year four for BSDP, we also have five states. We're right in the middle of all those site visits and are almost finished. And what we're trying to do is gather promising practices on how these SEAs are thinking about and organizing strategic communication. And then we want to give these folks some content expertise. So um, some have said to us, we really want to understand how do we know that we're communicating with the field? And so we're, we're trying to provide some content expertise and then create support networks. So we have some SEAs that have literally said, you know, we're struggling with communicating with the field. But we have a couple of other SEAs that that's a real strength with what they're doing. So we're trying to get these folks together so they have the opportunity to share their thinking and their practice. And that's what we did last year with our convening. We'll have another convening 
this year, it'll be we're going to have a webinar for the participants in the um, in July, and then we'll have a, a bigger convening with opening it up to other folks in early fall. So this is a model, and I don't know how well you'll be able to, to read the text, but this is a model that we built last year. This is um, built upon strategic communication approach from the Department of Defense that found out after 9-11 that having all these disparate organizations and, and divisions and departments that have a piece of national security but that aren't, aren't aligned and communicating is a problem. And so they developed this model. And um, it, 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 it doesn't look exactly like this. We kind of we fit it. But this is the model that we're using. And the idea is to get an understanding of how it really fits across this complex um, process of communicating internally and externally to the public. So um, the first part is leadership. So a message would be led by a leader. What are the kind of major tenets of the message? And then that message uh, it sits above internal and external communication, and it needs to be aligned. Internal com communication refers to kind of all the departments that lead and implement whatever the, the reform approach is. And, and it also includes, it depends on how the SCA considers legislative, but it could be inter there is some internal and external there. External is important to understand that there are really kind of two audiences with external. So with the, the LEAs themselves, the practitioners that have to implement whatever reforms are coming out. And then there's the general public, which is also very important. Because as we found with one SCA, you may have everything lined up uh, and, and ready to go, but one FDA had their um, reforms that went out for public referendum. They didn't expect that to happen. It got voted down and everything went out the doorway. So they had a lesson learned there. So the, the message campaign, whether you want to or not, will, will sit over those two pieces. And it's important to think about how do you align those pieces. And then the last part is that um, there needs to be some kind of a evaluation and feedback loop. I'm sure the evaluators here will appreciate that. You need to understand how well does the message uh, work for the different stakeholders. Do they understand it? Do they buy it? Does it make sense? Are the communication vehicles that you're using, is that working? Are you hitting the right audience? And then how do you, how do you make adjustments? So what makes this, the, the model that I just showed you, what makes it a strategic process? <clears throat> Excuse me, and how is that different from how SDAs from a few years ago, when they were just working on communication, how does that differ? Well, instead of it being a department that's kind of off over here and they do communication, often it was thought of in the past as you have a public information officer, and the main thought about communication is that it's an external media type of role. And now uh, SDAs are gradually thinking about it as a holistic agency-wide process, where it really cuts across the entire agency. It's tied to agency goals, um, you know, usually the strategic plan. It's tied to agency goals. Um, and it considers those internal and external uh, stakeholders that, that I talked about. And so knowing that, you have to change the language depending on who the stakeholders are. Um, a, a quick aside, one of the, the SEAs that we talked to, the one that had their, um, their, their uh, the referendum vote, what they learned was they were extremely good at communicating to legislators. That's short bullet points that are easy to consume. But when you are talking to an ex external stakeholders, it's very different. It's, it, it's very emotional, uh, more because people connect to schools on an emotional level. And so they realized that they hadn't hit that other external audience. Um, it keeps control of the message ahead of time. So if you know that you're about ready to come out and communicate about a new teacher evaluation, you really have to think strategically ahead of time to anticipate what's going to happen and really get the message out there on what you're trying to accomplish, for example, um, so that on the front end you have that instead of being in defensive mode. And then it employs a continuous feedback process that we talked about. So that makes it strategic. So given all that, what, what do the SDAs do? And what did we see in the benchmarking from last year and, and this year that, that seems to be working? One is that communication is a line from one point. And so the top level leadership needs to be involved in crafting the message, communicating it out. And typically there's another layer between, depending on how big the SEA is, where someone is working with the chief or superintendent then to get it to these other layers. But that it's done in a way that's consistent and clear. And then communi consider the communication needs at the different levels. So who are we really trying to talk to? We have put up um, at BSCP a few tools. We're still vetting them and putting it up 
Um, and one of the tools, I'm not sure if we posted that one yet, is a way that SEAs can sit down and just write down who their stakeholders are and, and kind of map that out so that, that it's, it's a thoughtful project process up front. Multiple opportunities to share information. The um, SEA leaders that we spoke to that seem to be doing a good job of communicating will always say, you know, communicate it, over communicate it. I feel like I'm successful when I'm communicating when people tell me it's too much and to stop. So multiple, multiple opportunities in different ways. You know, you have social media, uh, listservs, external, you know, engagement opportunities, but lots of opportunities to share and gain information. Adjust the messages to meet your communication goals, whether you're trying to get um, clarity out to the field or you're trying to gain stakeholder support. You know, why are we changing these standards? What are they really? You no, know, the feds didn't sit in a corner and write all these. That's not how these originally happened. So all those types of things. Um, acknowledge the differences between policymakers, uh, implementers, and the general public because these are different audiences and you probably have a different purpose. And then um, a lot of the SDAs that did well tested these on small stakeholder groups to make sure that the messages make sense. And never was a time when they did that that they didn't end up adjusting the message. Um, create an organizational structure and culture that fosters open communication. Now this one is actually turning out more so to be key. Uh, and we're finding out this year too. And give it, if I have the time, you'll let me know. Sure. At the end, I'll show you a quick overview of the way one FDA structured itself that worked particularly well to avoid many of the pitfalls. Um, but just how you organize your departments make a really big difference. So um, one of them that I, I just visited last week, everything under instruction fit under one person, everything, accountability, everything. It was, it's a very big department, but everything was under this person rather than having, you know, instruction here, uh, accountability in another <coughs> Light it up. That in and of itself made a difference. Pro uh, proximity makes a difference, and that's not something the SDA can always control. But even if you're on different levels in the same building, that gets tricky for just that ad hoc, impromptu, you know, coming over and speaking to governmental relations. It makes a difference. We were in a number of SDAs that are in a completely different building, and it's fascinating how they talked about how it really creates the, and you don't even mean it, it's just natural, and us, them, those people in that building. And, and no matter how hard they try to avoid that, it's still a reality. Um, encourage cross-division approaches, so having intentional meeting times where divisions that logically should work together have an opportunity to collaborate. And I've been in SDAs where the leadership didn't necessarily think that that would be valued, but the folks um, that were doing that work that had an, you know, an ad hoc opportunity they created themselves really liked it. Um, and so that, that's something that worked well for, for some of the SDAs. And then consider, consider what should and should not fall under communication. This became really apparent more this year. Communication is an area that everything fits under, absolutely everything. So you have, um, you know, media relations, you have uh, the website, you have public information requests, you have, you know, managing surveys, and, and just an, a stunning amount of things that you wouldn't think of that need to be organized and parsed out. And the, the communication department, which isn't usually large in a lot of SEAs, cannot do all of that. And so, and, and you know, they would say, well, I don't understand why IT isn't handling that, or I don't understand, you know, why isn't, isn't legal handling like that. So that's a really important thing to think about on the front end is capacity there. Um, another thing that we found out that is really important is, is how do you, Align communication between the policy-making folks. This is this is classic problem here. The policy-making folks and the folks that implement it. Um, and so, having a close relationship with governmental relations. Uh, Idaho was one place that was uh, in the, the uh, project last year, and their communication director was speaking weekly, uh, formally, but but you know constantly with governmental relations. And what was helpful to her is that when something came out that was a policy and people said, well, you know, there's these myths about how that came to be. She was right there and was able to respond to the public, no, this is who was there. And so that was, that was really important. And then leverage information from the voices in the field. So there were some, I believe it was Arkansas was a state that had um, not only Teachers of the Year talking about Common Core and how it impacted their um, classrooms and really made a difference, but there were kids on videos that, 
you know, last year we did this stuff and it was separated, it didn't make sense, and this year. So using the voices from the field to, to kind of keep control of the message and really understand, I mean, it, it's hard when you have all this buzz around a topic like standards, you can lose who the target is. It, it's for the students and the teachers, and they're the experts that are really the ones that can say whether these standards are, are better or not better for kids. And the, the last set of, of outcomes I'll talk about, I think it's the last set of outcomes I'll talk about is using multiple tools and strategies around controversial issues. Um, I don't have enough time to dive into the particulars they are in the benchmarking uh, report that we have, but there were a whole lot of, of interesting things that they did. You want to address concerns early and often. We had SDA had really nice, quick fact sheets. They were meeting with legislators early before that came on. Um, with stakeholders so that they really understood using voices of the field that I talked about. And then, you know, bring the opposers and the supporters to the table. One quick thing that Idaho found out, they were, the, they were the state that had all their reforms they spent a long time on just totally go away because of referendum vote. Uh, and what that uh, leader said at the time was, when you have a meeting, a stakeholder meeting, and you have folks that say, I'm there to support you, broadcast those meetings. You have record then who is there, who is saying that they support you. Later, when you turn around and nobody's standing behind you, <laughs> at least, and people are saying that, that it was made up somewhere else, you have some evidence there. So, some real interesting little just tactics or, or you know hindsight that we learned from some of these states. And then it's really important to have feedback tools, information. That's probably. Um, the area where states are, are um, that's less of a strength. There are, there's the typical things like website hits and things like that, and some uh, random surveys attached to certain types of, of meetings or convenings, but it's not really uh, thought out how that's done, and I think a more uh, a strategic way to evaluate how well that's working would be helpful. Um, so like I mentioned, we're doing the site visits now. We're almost finished. We're going to have an informal webinar for the participants on the 19th, and then we'll have a meeting in the fall. Let me get to, I think you can read this pretty well. So there was an SDA. I was actually just in this SDA um, last week. But the way this was, and this is, this is not a, a verbatim picture of their org chart, but you had um, the chief, the superintendent, and, and her role was mostly outward facing to the public. So she set the message. She did a lot of outward facing. She did three school visits a week. She was out in the field a lot. Her chief of staff was more internal. He hardly ever left and was met with her daily. She also had with her cabinet as daily calls with the immediate cabinet. And the immediate cabinet are folks on that top level row. And what we find in all the SDAs is you have, um, if I could draw a, a circle, you, you know, around this, the chief chief of staff in that top level row, those are regular meetings that happen pretty often, at least weekly, almost in every SDA. So internal communication there is pretty connected, pretty clear. Keep people feel feel pretty clear. Where you start, where it starts to get fuzzy, is the next level under. So the person on instruction was above all things instruction. What was really interesting was she that is a presentation that had to do with anything academic, academic reform, which is, is a high percentage of things coming out of the SDA. But for content purposes, she vetted things first. And then it would go to the communication department that would, you know, make sure that it's clear and, and you know, not jargoning and that it got delivered in the way that it needed to be. And then the people, there were actually two people under her. One, uh, one was kind of student support, and then hers was academic. And then those people, so the, the, what they call the E team, the executive team, that top layer. And then the A team were the people under them. So you have the assistant superintendent of school improvement. And then the implementer folks are under there. That was the A team. <coughs> got a little fuzzier. They weren't always as connected. Um, they had meetings, but they weren't as um, well as they could have been, and so, but usually where the bigger breakdown is down below with the folks that are actually trying to implement policy, and they're actually actually all also communicating externally about the approach and policy. So it's that's a really important area to make sure is connected. 
um, real quickly with their communication department, the things that were, so a big problem we're having from some SEAs is they're in charge of everything. So they're in charge of public information requests. And in some states, those are huge. And in this organization, that was over with legal team. And we had another SEA that, because it's a survey and it goes out on the website, they were in charge of the technology for all surveys. It just, with all the things that this team of three did, that just didn't make sense. And so really thinking about what is a, a IT type of job, and you know, you even have like e-learning, you know, so really thinking about the many different things that fall under communication, what makes sense to be over relations in legal, in, you know, that's driven by academics. And so that's an important thing to think about that we're having a lot of issues with SEA. And I will Great. stop right there. That's probably yeah. my time. That's perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if you have any questions for, for Heather, feel free to write them down. We're going to move on to our next speaker, Dr. Diane DeBacker, who is, as you can see on your screen, she is Director of Education Research for RTI International and is the former Kansas Chair of Education. And another fun fact is that she was a Senior Education Advisor to the Abu Dhabi Education Council in the United Arab Emirates. So yep. very cool. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've been home a year now, and there's a, a little bit about that, not a lot, but mostly just to to remind ourselves that um, it's it's nice to live in a country where you do have a voice, um, and that and, and even though we talk about how contentious some of our standards have been, I mean every state around here has had some type of um, questioning about whether or not the standards were correct. We live in a country where you can question, and so um, especially as we approach the 4th of July. For that. Um, it's my pleasure to be here, um, and uh, I think what I'll, what I'll be able to do for you is take what Heather talked about in the studies that they've done across three different states and, and show you what it was like in one state. Um, and before I talk about the specifics, I just want to tell you a little bit about how Kansas is structured because it's different um, from many of the states sitting around here. We have an elected Board of Education, so those 10 members are elected on a four-year term, and um, so that's different from yours where you have them appointed by governor, but uh, they're elected Board of Education members. Article 6 of our Constitution is constantly brought up in the state of Kansas is the authority of K-12 education to those elected board members. And I see uh, some people smiling around the room because you know you have another something within your own state, not in Article 6, but something similar. The legislature, on the other hand, appropriates the funds. And sometimes that's where you get into a bit of a tussle. Uh, the Commissioner of Education, the uh, position that I held for about five years, um, is appointed by those 10 elected state board members. So keep that in mind as you think about the experience and comparing it to yours. Um, within the Constitution, it says that uh, the curriculum standards are to be set by the State Board of Education. They set the standards in five different content areas, as you can see up there. Every seven years, they're reviewed. It used to be every five years, but we found out that five years was not nearly long enough to see if a set of standards was um, was going was doing what needed to be done, and also we did gauge a lot of that off of what was happening with the national association. So you think about the National Math Association, National Science Association; those aren't typically reviewed, um, but about every seven years. So it just so happened in Kansas, the timing was perfect. It was um, uh, it was really the the perfect alignment of when our standards were up for review and when the National Governors Association and the Council for Chief State School Officers um, decided to work on standards. So ours were up for review in 2010. So the process that we used to adopt the Common Core Standards, and we did call them the Common Core Standards in the beginning. As Heather said, there were um, we did make some changes along there. But in the spring of 2009, NGA, Council of uh, Chief State School Officers, began the work to develop those common core standards in math and English language arts. Again, if you think back to when ours were to be reviewed, it was the absolutely perfect timing for us. So in response, 
instead of doing the process that we had typically done, which was just a very insular type of uh, process within Kansas, we formed a couple different committees. We formed an executive review committee, which was a very select committee. So it was our, our state math, our state top people in math and in English language arts. So you all have them in your state. You could name them for me right now. Name your top 10 math people in your state, and you could do that. So we had that in the two content areas. Then we had a larger review committee. And then um, most of those consisted of Kansas educators and SDE or Kansas State Department of Education staff members. We submitted comments during each of the comment period. For those of you who are around during that time, you know that you could submit comments to NGA and Council of Chief, Chief State School Officers. We did that. Um, one of the smartest things we did is we updated our board every month on what was happening, even if not much had happened. It was on our agenda. So it goes back to something that Heather talked about, making sure that you have a record of what you did, because that was very important, and you'll see that in a timeline coming up here pretty soon. Our state board adopted Common Core Standards on October 12th of 2010. What's interesting about that is that I had served for a year as the interim commissioner, and that was actually the same day that they appointed me the permanent commissioner. So uh, you know, it was, it was kind of a, a very uh, interesting day in that uh, I know Heather is actually laughing about that. But um, so I had served for a year as interim, and they decided they, they liked me enough, and I liked them enough, uh, that we they, they did that first, and then. Uh, went ahead and approved the Common Core Standards. It was a really a very smooth process for us, the, the Common Core Standards. Um, we, um, we felt like the standards that we had at the time were very much aligned with coming out. Uh, so we felt, felt very, very comfortable with that. Um, our process also included some other things, and I think it's important to, to visit about these a little bit, because many of, uh, of, what we, of what we did is also in, in Heather's work. Um, we rely, align them with our college and career expectations. At the time, Kansas had a P-20 council. Again, I think most of your states also did that. So our P-20 council, uh, I was co-chair of that, along with our president and CEO of our board of regents, our higher ed system. Um, we did a gap analysis through that P-20 council according to what we already had, what the Common Core standards looked like. Um, Achieve assisted us with that gap analysis, and that's one of my points, is that use your partners as much as you can. Um, and I'll, I'll visit about that a little bit more. Uh, the University of Kansas, which is um, one of, you might have heard of the Kansas Jayhawks, that's where they reside. Um, they, uh, the professors of math and English looked at those common core standards, and I'll never forget the comment that the, the mm -hmm. leads of that made. They said, if high school students can do this getting out of high school, then we are going to have to change what we do as they start college. We're going to have to change because they're going to be much further ahead than what we typically see students. So we had this great endorsement from, from our P20 Council, from um, the Achieve Gap Analysis to um, our, one of our biggest universities. We had public meetings about the standards everywhere. Everybody on our staff, um, similar organization to what Heather showed up there, but every member of our staff said yes to every invitation. So if it was a breakfast with a literary club in somebody's house on Saturday morning, we were there. If it was in a big auditorium where there were a thousand people there, we were there. We, we went to everything so that people would know about the standards. And that was before we knew that there was going to be any questioning of the standards. That's just how we do business in Kansas. I think it's very similar to how you do business in the Appalachia region. Is uh, you 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 know pretty hospitable, and you say yes to most of the invitations, especially as public servants as most of you are. Uh, you, you say yes. We had a Kansas Education Commission that I had formed while I was interim commissioner. Um, of some of our top educators and administrators in the state and, and others um, that looked at it. Our Board of Regents had endorsed it. They had signed the MOU. We were part of Smarter Balance um, at that time. We did the survey of enacted curriculum, which was through CCSSO, that kind of gave us an idea of where our current standards were. And then we used that Common Core, um, Achieve Common Core tool. So we did lots of things as we went about adopting those standards. 
We also had, we knew that we had um, a lot of good company. So this is at the time um, the states that had adopted Common Core, everything in yellow, the red, the states had not at that time. And that, of course, has changed a little bit since then. But we really felt confident that we had um, chosen the right path for developing this round of standards that would be with us for seven years um, and try to put it in that context. Here's a timeline, I think that this is important to look at because um, remember we began that review in the spring of 2009. It aligned perfectly with when we would have done that as our state anyhow. October of 2010, our state board adopted those standards. Through 2011 and 2012, districts started implementing the new standards. And that was completely up to the district as to how they wanted to do that. We gave a recommended timeline for implementation. Um, but it was not mandated. We're a local control state, and um, so we left that up to the district. So they had had those two full years of, of implementing. In December of 2012, though, our state board decided to change the name of the Common Core Standards to Kansas College and Career Ready Standards. And that was in response to some rumbling that we had heard um, throughout the throughout the United States that there may be some questioning in the next legislative session um, about the Common Core Standards and that they were federal. You guys know the whole story. I don't need to go through that. So our board was very proactive in saying, you know, ours weren't. I mean, our, we, we have confidence in our process, but in order to um, try to be ahead of that message, as Heather said, we changed the name to the Kansas College and Career Ready Standards. Not surprisingly, in the spring of 2013, our legislature, our House uh, Education Committee, had a bill introduced to ban the Common Core Standards in the state of Kansas. So um, it did kind of play out the way that we thought it was going to play out. And really from that point on, from the spring of 2013, we were in defense mode in the state of Kansas. And, um, but we survived that because we had documented everything that we had done. We had, um, and we felt that we had input from lots of people. You could see the process that we had with the other people that we had involved. And so um, we were able to, to keep that at bay in spring of 2013. Um, spring of 2015, the legislature, it actually, I should go back to 2013. That bill did not make it out of committee. And so things just kind of sat still during, during 2014. There were, you know, some things connected to it. Spring of 2015, our legislature, the bill did come out. Legislator, legislated votes to ban the Common Core Standards. That vote failed by a very slim margin. That vote failed at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was in the galley as that vote was happening, and I was just like, oh. Um, but it, it, it did fail. And then in the fall of 2015, our SEA began the review process according to the timeline. Next year is 2017. Remember, ours is reviewed every seven years. It's 2010. So right on the timeline, we're reviewing our standards again. Um, we have done it a little bit differently this time around, or that the new commissioner has. And I, Randy Watson is his name. I give him great, he's doing a tremendous job and great credit. He has placed every vocal opponent to the standards on that committee, <laughs> on the committee. So um, what is that saying? Keep your friends close in and thank you. Everybody. Yeah. Um, so here's some lessons learned. Strategic communication plan is absolutely necessary. We didn't have one. I can honestly tell you, and I bet Heather has found this out in her research as she was at Kansas, we did not have one. We could easily put one together after the fact, and we did some things right. Um, I think it's because some very smart people were working on it, um, people on my team and the educators that were uh, in the state. But we didn't have a plan that we laid out. Um, we knew what we wanted to communicate, who we needed to communicate with. We knew to be honest. We knew to be transparent. Um, but we didn't, we didn't have a roadmap. And I think we, that's a lesson learned. A roadmap is essential. Now, that roadmap is going to change. You're going to take a few detours along the way. There's going to be a few speed bumps. But the mat, we, should have, we should have had a better plan. Uh, we were very transparent and honest. And again, I think that's just part of who we are um, as, as a state. Lots of stakeholder engagement. We, um, 
we engage everybody we can, and this is where I really put a, a plug in, and, and I'll do it again. Um, and Nate mentioned it in his welcome to us, is we are not, SEAs are not as good as we should be as to using the resources that are available. As you think about your comp centers, as you think about your regional labs, as you think about your equity centers, as you think about your universities, your business partners that are out there, be sure and get all of those stakeholders engaged. We communicated to everyone and everywhere. You heard me say that. We listened. Um, and we made changes as, as we went along. Um, we educated. So, uh, you know, every time I did a presentation on the Common Core Standards, I had examples of the standards. So that people who didn't know it, they had heard, you know, they had heard about how horrible they were, and you would give those examples, especially of elementary math, and they'd say, do people have a problem with those? I mean, so we educated as we went along, and we had multiple people delivering the same message. The message wasn't just from me. Um, the message was from everybody who went out. It didn't matter who was talking about them. We had a standard template, so we everybody had the same PowerPoint uh, presentation. We all reviewed it. We practiced it like we were just, you know, doing our first speech in third grade. We practiced it. We made sure we, we critiqued each other as they did their presentation. We tried to throw them questions that would come their way. So everybody delivered that message. Um, again, the assistance from our partners. We did rely on our comp center a lot. Um, our, at that time, we were um, uh, obviously we're still in at Rail Central, so we got to be very good friends with Donna and Belinda mm -hmm. at Central and South Central. We used our Rail a lot, our, our Rail Central, which is out in Denver. Um, the other thing that helped us out is that we really got it down to time and money. As legislators or others would say, you need to do something different. We need to change these standards. We told them how long it would take. The average time to do standards in the state of Kansas is 18 months. It takes time to do that. It takes money. We also then tied it back to the assessments at that time we were going to be part of Smarter Balanced, and we said <coughs> it's going to take millions of dollars to deliver to develop new assessments. And that um, that resonated especially with legislatures. Um, Kansas is. At that time, they were beginning a downhill slide. We're at the very bottom now. We now have nowhere to go but up um, in terms of our budget. Um, but that did resonate. And But the thing I think that did the best is we talked about how demoralizing this was for educators and that they had spent two years. You remember that timeline. They had already had two years into these standards changing lessons changing curriculum, changing the way they teach, districts investing you know, lots of money and time in professional development. And so our teachers were the ones who really had the strongest voice in front of those committees and in front of any of the opponents saying, um, you know, this is, this, this is hard for us to do as educators. We, we can't really switch on a dime. We believe in what we're doing. We believe that these standards will make a difference. You need to give us time and let us show you that the proof will be in the pudding if you just give us enough time. So we talked a lot about that. And I end on something that's a little cute, is that it is important that you do communicate, no matter what. And this one says, and that's why we lift on three. And you can see the guys put kind of sticking up there. They didn't lift on three. I believe that we did lift on three in Kansas for the most part. So it's, a, it's my pleasure to communicate uh, about those standards. and. Uh, Thank you so much Thank for letting you. me be here. Thank you. There we go. Okay, great. Now we're going to transition to Mike Martin, who is going to talk about strategic communications in Kentucky and Tennessee. Yes. Um, so I hopefully will hit on a lot of the same points, make a few, um, a lot of what I just heard resonated a lot with what, what we saw in Tennessee and Kentucky in terms of best practices, not perfect practices, but like a lot of good things. So I'm just going to basically run through um, some key takeaways that um, we had looking at the communication about standards in Kentucky and Tennessee, which were really seen, you know, starting around 2008, 2009, as leading states really um, doing a really good job. And it's been hard, as many of you know, for, for both of those states as well. So I just want to talk through um, what we found, um, and 
I'm just going to go through these points quickly, um, and and the first of which is this idea of proactivity, right? So um, it gets a lot harder to communicate about something when people are already distrustful of it. In other words, and that I just it it's amazed me. I'll, Prior to this job, I worked at the North Carolina Department of Education over the course of, you know, implementing the Common Core. It was, it's just really interesting to see how much harder it is to communicate when your audience doesn't trust you. So moving quickly <laughs> is really, really important. I would say, too, I mean, you know a lot of what these things are, but, the, the, you know, websites, webcasts, face-to-face -face meetings, all these things were done in Tennessee and Kentucky. Um, and one of the other things that, that I think both these states did and other states that do this successfully is they get good at communicating about communicating. That is, collecting the data that says we met with this number of principals and teachers, we talked about this issue in these different forms, and they really, the SEA really carefully collects that and has that on the ready. Part of that is because it's just really, really hard to, you know, in a state like North Carolina, we have almost 100,000 teachers. And so it's really, really hard to actually have, make each one of those teachers feel like they've been talked to. And that's, and that's just a, a central challenge of, of, a, of an SEA. And, and so I think they become good at saying, well, these are all the, maybe you didn't get talked to, but these are all the avenues that we did um, talk to, to people and communicate about it. Secondly, I think Tennessee and Kentucky are great examples um, of coordinated communication. So the SEA is not at all alone in this. There is the governor and there is the legislature, and I think in Tennessee and Kentucky, both of those in the Bashir and with um, Bredesen and Haslam, um, the governor was really communicating about it. And that is really, really important. So I think that's another part of the, when we get into a conversation about this that I think is really important. How does the SEA sit in with all the other um, bodies and policymakers. Thirdly, um, uh, educator engagement. Um, obviously, that's really important. Um, and I think educator engagement, both to communicate with them, but then to get them as advocates. Um, because there's just there's something positionality-wise that sitting in an SEA, it makes it hard to communicate and and be authentic. For as much as I taught high school math for five years, I'm very much self-identified as a, as a math teacher. But once you're out of the classroom, you don't have that positionality and, and authenticity. So I think engaging educators and getting them to speak on behalf is really important. Um, both of these states, I think, use really simple messages, um, kid-based messages, right? You know, in Tennessee, the, the thing they, they we're saying is, you know, we have not been truthful in our advertising about what, how kids are performing. Um, so just having really simple kid-based messages is, was important for both of them. Um, engaging partners, again, sometimes the SEA is not the best voice, and so it's really important to have the business community, higher ed, parents, and obviously educators, principals, teachers engaged and, and, and able to to um, talk about the transition. Um, plan for the inevitable. In the case of Tennessee and Kentucky, this I think was really a lot about score drop. I think that was really good. Like both of those states did a really good job of planning for that inevitability. Like we knew that when the standards were going to be implemented, that test scores were going to go down. And in both cases, at least back a few years, that was not met with a ton of pushback, which it could have easily been. Now, on the other hand, I think there was another kind of thing that happened with the Common Core that maybe wasn't planned for as well, not just in Tennessee and Kentucky, but in many states. Um, you know, number seven, I think this is, we talk students' education and the economy. What do we mean by this? And Governor Hunt, who still is, I don't know how old he is, 78, and is still very active in our institute. And this is something, you know, of course, he was, an education governor, 16 years as a governor. Uh, but he's very, very good about connecting, um, you know, messages to the health and opportunity of the individual and of the state. And I think both of these, both Tennessee and Kentucky, in the transition, had that 
as a central part of the message. Um, and lastly, uh, there's just a, a number of good examples of the commissioners and the governors and folks in the SEA meeting with stakeholders. Um, and so getting feedback, and part of that is just really listening and then um, modifying your message based on what you hear. Um, so those are the, the big takeaways. I think they reflect a lot of similar things to what you heard um, previously. I just have a couple kind of points moving forward that I think can be sort of maybe a good place for us to jump off in terms of the conversation. And this is a challenging question, but I think there's really setting aside the issue of how well you communicate about anything, and, and this has been talked about already. And I say this with some hesitation because, you know, as a person who cares about the outcome, outcomes for kids and, and making sure that SEAs are really working hard on behalf of kids, I think there's also something to be, there's probably a point at which there's just too much change on the system. Maybe it's more than the SEA can handle, but maybe it's more than teachers can handle. Um, and so I think, I think this is a really important conversation. The, the thing that we sort of saw, particularly in Tennessee and Kentucky, um, and in no way do I think one is, is the, the right way and the other is wrong, but Kentucky really led with just standards, assessment, and accountability. And Tennessee re reformed the standards and the assessment, but also really pushed teacher evaluation. And, you know, to Nate's point, they are seeing some really positive results. I also think that, that that puts an obvious additional amount of pressure on the system and on educators. So I think that's an important question, especially as, you know, states look to respond to ESSA. There's a lot of, you know, return of decision-making to states. And I think, I think there's probably lessons to be learned from that. Um, I don't even know that I have to talk too much about this one, but I, I say this particularly about standards because, you know, as a former teacher and a, and a person who worked in professional development, I've known and been engaged in looking at state standards for however long I've been working, which is, what, I don't know, it's a long time now. <laughs> um, but I think that if you go back seven or eight years, parents just didn't know what standard, like people didn't think about it. Um, and so, but I think we're in a new, I think it's a new time. I think people know about it now. I also think one of the other things that we have to really think about about communication is it seems to me that the argument that, well, standards are not curriculum is, is like kind of an impossible thing to communicate about. I mean, I'd be interested to hear what everybody thinks about that, but it, that has proven itself to be really, really, really a challenge, and I think that will be a challenge for standards generally, is that, you know, when you see assignments and you don't like them, it's the standards. Yes. And so I think, you know, obviously what I'm not advocating for, I think, is SEA's developing curriculum, but I think we have to plan for it. I don't know what the answer is then. Um, and just two last things I think this relates kind of to ESSA is that I think, you know, as we have higher standards and states particularly look at modifying grading systems and accountability systems, I think there's an opportunity to really think carefully about how when we implement higher standards and put them into accountability systems, just thinking consequentially about what that will mean for states and communicating about that. And then lastly, I think ESSA, you know, I've seen this, we had an event in February and it was titled Opportunities and Responsibilities. That's how everybody's talking about it. ESSA. In other words, it returns a lot of decision making to states and with that a lot of responsibility. So in some ways I think that's a really exciting time for SEA leadership. Um, but I also think there's a lot of things that have happened over the last six or seven years that we've learned a lot from. They've been really ambitious and, and I think I'm hopeful that you know states can take it from this point and really lead in a really positive way. Excellent. Thank you so much to all of the panelists. Um, I want to move into some questions, and I know we are almost at 11 o'clock, and we have until 11.30, so we'll just kick it off with some discussion among the panel. And I'd love to hear from you all, particularly since in the ARC region, we have many states that have a lot of rural 
districts. And so I'm curious what advice you would have for FDAs that, that are dealing with that and what strategies may have stood out that apply to a rural context. And anyone can that off. Well, one thing I will say is, is um, one of the things we've, we've seen that's coming out, um, BSCP did, um, we had this publication called FDA of the Future that was focused on rural schools. Mm -hmm. And so we talked to a lot of stakeholders in FDAs and, and the field from rural schools. And one of the things that, that happens is that policymakers sometimes, for, there's so much focus on urban mm -hmm. that they, they're, they're forgetting about just the, the differences with urban and rural. And so you'll make a policy um, that works for urban districts, but because of, of size and scale and distance, it doesn't work for rural schools, so there's that. And then there's the, just the obvious that you have to be sure that um, the message is getting out there to everyone and that um, the vehicle works for everyone. So, you know, there's sometimes there's there's access, you know, technology access challenges and things like that, and um, there just needs to be an effort to make sure to include the different stakeholders. And in Kansas, we obviously we have a we have more rural than we have anything mm -hmm. else. Um, and what what help does? And I'm not I'm not sure that I always thought it was the best structure, but now I think it is. Um, we have education service centers. I think most of your states have something similar. But our education service centers, there's um, I think there's seven of them across the state. They're independent. They're not under the State Department of Ed. Uh, they're their own um, entities, and so they, and but they're great partners. And so they take what what I mean. First of all, they have a lot of say in in the policies they're being formed because they're very um, active with their local state board of education members or the people who are voted from their area. Um, but they're able to take that, and then because they don't have the constraints of the state department, they're able to be much more creative in how they go about solving. <laughs> problems within their own region. So um, I think that was that was our greatest assistance with our rural communities because they are in those rural communities and they're able to put their own flavor and their own spin on it and yet still come around kind of through the back door and meeting the requirements of the policy. Just one thing I would say about that in North Carolina is I do think like whoever whoever the the, the folks are like especially like in a state like North Carolina you know, you have a lot of, you know, pretty far-flung places from Raleigh. <laughs> um, and I think that it's really important that, you know, if you, you know, we, in North Carolina we have regional leads. And I, I think it's important, I, some of the dynamic when it doesn't go as well as you would like it is sort of a pass-through. So, like, so basically that person that's out in the mountains gets an email before the districts do, but that's about it, versus making sure that that person who's going to be representative of what's happening in the SEA deeply understands it, believes in it, um, as, as the person who's going to be local there. Um, and I think, you know, that's been certainly successful in some cases. And when it's not, it's when it's just a kind of like chain of knowing about things. Like, how does that make sense? Thank you. And one of the things we didn't get to touch on much in, in our earlier, uh, in the earlier portion of this session is social media and how uh, State Departments of Education might leverage that or not um, in the discussion. But certainly it's one of the ways that resistance is coming up or you're able to monitor what the public is saying about uh, standards and how can State Departments get in front of that or utilize social media to um, to get their message across and control the message. <laughs> in, in Kansas, uh, they, their, their communications department is um, now a whole, they've added a fifth person. I mean, they, they a very, very small department. Right. One communications director, as Heather kind of alluded to in hers, they, they're, they're everything, you know, they're, they're washing the dishes in the, in the, in the, in the, in the community kitchen and they're, they're, I mean, they're, they do everything. They're taking the pictures at the summer kickoff for, you know, summer reading. Um, and so one is that I think we just, they don't have, they, they don't have a lot of capacity in 
terms of communication. And many of them in the communications department um, have a few years on them. I don't know how to say it any more kindly. Um, but <laughs> I, I think just, and, and maybe it's just, you know, you talked about student groups and how other, how some states, Nate talked about how Commissioner McQueen is starting to use student groups to help solve some problems. Get a, get a young person in, I mean, get anybody that's in high school in and say, how would you communicate this message and make it so it seems appealing? Um, so one is just more capacity, relying on some partners, and really getting some people in who know how to do social media. I, I'm not very good at it. I mean, I will tweet about something before, you know, before I hit my plane this afternoon about this thing, but you know, there's some people that are just so darn good at it. And so I think we need, as, as state education agencies, we need more in professional development in that area. Yeah. I know in Kansas City. Well, I'm seeing in the field, SEAs are using social media a lot. Um, and we do have some tools that we put up there, too. Some of them are doing a good job at making sure it's, it's pretty well coordinated. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, that helps. Uh, keep it as a proactive vehicle for messaging. And it's interesting, too, a couple things to think about. Well, one is a generational gap. And then I think about, um, so Terry Holiday in Kentucky would be known uh, to, when he, before he was retired, to take his iPhone and film some big convening he's at and then post it and put it out there. And so uh, he himself used it a lot. He was a great example of getting out to the field. And then you have to think about what are the rules and policies uh, in LEAs around social media. So if you're trying to reach teachers and teachers aren't allowed to use Facebook, then you know your Facebook page may not be that. So it's just kind of figuring out what the, the local rules and policies are. Um, but the, the SEAs are using social media a lot to communicate with the public, and it seems to be a good vehicle for them as far as we found so far. It's funny, one of the things we, through some of our work, we were engaged with, or were working with like a public relations firm, and one of the things, it was just they were having a conversation, and one of the things that they said was, you know, basically one of the things that is not a winner is to engage with someone who's being negative. In other words, try to like, uh, they were basically like, it is not a battle that you can win if you are basically reacting to somebody on an internet, on like a chat. It just goes poorly. You don't win hearts and minds. You just create, I don't know what, a, an audience for that. So I think like, yeah, I mean, that's sort of unfortunate. Like that, there, that's not really a, a forum for debating the issues. But well, on the other hand, like I do think what well is just being positive about the things that are happening within the school. So it's not like, you know, a tweet that says, you know, our standards are great, but it's a tweet that says, this is what's happening in X county, here's a picture, here's the professional development they're doing. So it's about educators and people and not about the politics and the policy. Maybe we should adopt that. Uh, that the car commercial that's on now, that you can only react to the car and the features and emoji. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should try that one. It just react. So we may have some kind of nasty emojis come back, but at least you don't have that verbiage. It's just that fit and that's fine. I think that sparks another thought, and it's kind of related to social media, but how does it, you know, so you have the general public, and, and some SEAs have a really good website where folks can find information, some don't. Mm -hmm. We had one SEA that they really spent a good, I want to say like 70% of their time answering questions because their website almost caused more information frustration mm -hmm. than not. And then there was another one I was just recently in that came up with a really nice tool on their website where folks can go in and ask questions and it leads them to it leads them to the person that can answer that question. And so not only are they able to analyze data on are the questions that are constantly coming in about what, so where do they need to communicate better, but it's helping the, the public uh, get to an answer easier, and it's taking a burden off the 
FDA. Now, the communications department was in charge of that, too. <laughs> um, so there is that, but mm -hmm. it still eliminated a lot of, of, of times answering mm -hmm. things. Um, so that, that was an interesting tool that they're using. And I think, like, one of the things you said that I think is really important is, like, because of the size of communication departments, mm -hmm. and also because communication departments often don't have like instructional expertise. And if you're talking about standards, it's just like you can't, like you can only talk about them in like their higher and better broad terms for so long <laughs> before people want to know. Yeah. yeah. And so, so in that sense, like communication as an effort needs to be part of like, uh, your org chart up right, there. And right. the, it needs to sit squarely in the instructional divisions or academic services or whatever it's called in a particular SEA is really working at, at getting those folks better at communicating. This, so this SEA I was in last week, this is the first time, you know, so we're, we're at about our ninth or tenth, um, but this is the first time I've seen that the person that's leading academics, one, is over everything that really is all things academic, it's under one place, but two, a, a large part of her role is communicating. Um, and she obviously said she's the front line and then it goes through the communication department, but it really seems to solve a lot of natural problems that occur. I saw there was a, a couple questions, uh, were a couple questions in the room, and then if there are any questions for those that are on the web, feel free to type them into the chat box and we can get to those as well. So I saw Gary, I saw your hand um, first, and then Sarah. It was, it was just a comment about what we were talking about briefly. One of the things on lots of kids by career opportunities in manufacturing. He's actually going now to the high level. Mm -hmm. so you, you were having a hard time describing seniors. Uh, here's, a, here's a guy, 60 years old, going out trying to talk to junior high kids. Hey, I, I'm not relatable. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's my grandfather up there talking to me about career. But, but what we found, I think, is what you guys talked about is really important. One, you need somebody with the knowledge and the passion to sit together. Mm -hmm. Number two, you need young person be relatable to the Thank kids. Mm -hmm. And the third thing, depending on where you're at, I'm from Morgantown and I'm down in Logan County trying to make a presentation. They start right off by, who are you? <laughs> right. you know, somebody local. So we uh, need a team approach when yeah. we go in. You get credibility with the young person, you get credibility from somebody local. The message is coordinated between the three and, and as a team you can do those kind of things. And I think it's to your point too, the communication department, four or five people can't do it. it needs Something that I heard um, from all three of you was that communication And, and CCSSO did a very good job of that uh, a couple years ago in um, not having the communication specialist come to separate meetings but come to the same meeting as the chief. Mm -hmm. And that made a tremendous difference, at least it did for Kansas. And the mm -hmm. first time I asked our communications director to, to go to the meeting, she said, why would I go to this? Right. Because you have to know what the message is. Mm -hmm. You have to hear yeah. what the others are saying across the United States. And I think... One of the leaders in doing that at the time was Idaho. I mean, mm -hmm. their their yes. communications person knew just as much as Tom yes. Luna did. And they're all gone now. Yeah, and they're all they're gone. All but, gone. 
So that, that's a really good point, that they're not somebody who's just in the background anymore. They're not the cameraman that's behind the camera, the camera person. They are out front, and they have to know that topic inside now. But there's a point there. We're still seeing a gap. So in, in the strategic communication, we're trying to get folks to connect it up at the LEA-wide level. And what we'd like to see is communication embedded all through an SEA communication plan. But when we had the convening last year, and we go and talk to people, and how was it? We had all these chiefs speaking about how they see and organize the role of communication, their SEAs. We had Tom Luna folks. And then we had communication directors. And the communication directors would say, well, the first half of the day, which was the leader, you know, was it useful to me? But the second half, so they're look, trying to get that connection between um, the top level leadership and communication and communication and the um, content experts. We're, we're getting there in some places, but we're not there in other places. So it's hard to meet the needs of, of SBAs when they're seeing it as a very separated, segmented activity. Yes, it was a good thing, um, but for a couple reasons. I mean, one is we did see the whole political um, um, controversy coming. I mean, there was we, we saw that that was going to happen. Um, so now there was because they were canceled. Yeah. We tried that yeah. Venue, but I, I, and I always speak for myself. I think it made us look like maybe we were trying to see something. Faster. Well, we again. I mean, I think there was some of that, but the other thing is that at about the same time, our governor came out with a big. Uh, College, community college or a tech college um, initiative that was all around that um, any student, any high school student, junior or senior could go to tech school free of charge. Um, and so that was all around college and career ready. So it made sense to time it at that same time. And then we were able to get our governor to, he never did fully support the new standards, but he never spoke out against them. And that was a win. I mean, sure. some people would see that as it wasn't a win, but it was a win that he didn't publicly speak out about them. Because had he, we probably would not have had that, that one vote would have failed, that, that 2 a.m. vote. Well, or it would have passed, rather. I understand the concept, because we could, although I think it looked like maybe we were trying to sneak something past the goalie, if we probably had not changed the standards, they probably yeah. would not be in place. Yeah. We, we had something else to go with ours, so that helped. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks yeah. nice yeah. question. Well, I see there's a comment uh, to share regarding using social media. When we launched our race to the top one two years ago, currently we partnered with the University of Pikeville to host and develop a social slash learning management system it's called the Holler. Holler. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
try to get at what their issues are, and there's a, there's a balance between trying to help them uh, kind of debunk whatever myths that they have versus you're digging in and it's an argument that's never going to go anywhere, um, but you certainly can't start that process without some kind of face-to-face -face and getting in there. We have a few uh, SCAs right now that what they really want to learn about is how do you communicate with legislators that are just very oppositional because you know they need to be supportive. And it's, it's the same kind of thing, just getting in one-on-one. -on -one. Idaho did a bit of that and just getting a lot of factual information out ahead of time so that folks could understand and get them to think about, have you read the standards? Because there's all, you know, people that, have you actually read the standards? Let's see if that's in there. I don't know if that's helpful. It is, yeah. And a lot of, I mean, what I've heard is that it has come from the legislators. You know, some of them are the ones that have the ideological resistance. Yes. And yes. how do you discuss, you know, do you go into their their camp, you know? And I mean, because, I mean, that may be. Yes. So one, so for one example, an SDA had a brown bag um, lunch, you know, at, at the Capitol. And they actually had the standards. And they unpacked them with them talked about them, tried to debunk some of those myths. So some of it is going going there to them. Um, there is a lot of weekly communication. You know, getting ready for a session, there's a lot to do. There's little myths and fact sheets and things to get out ahead of time, knowing what those myths are going to be, getting out in front of that, and just spending time with them. Because, you know, everybody has an opinion about the standards, and, and you ask, so did you read them? Right. <laughs> That's a great question. Did you read them? So, you know, unpacking bits of that. I think, Diane, you talked about that. Yeah. Really unpacking yeah. bits of it and saying, okay, now do you see, <laughs> do you see that and what, in there? Yeah, and what, what we did often, too, is we'd say, what standard, or can, give me an example of one that you're concerned about. And, you, and, and usually they couldn't answer it back. And we'd say, what, what are you concerned about? And oftentimes they'd come back with what the curriculum was that right. a local district right. with local control had right. chosen to use. And we'd say mm -hmm. that, that that might tie back to standard, you know, a second grade math standard. Um, but what you're not, and so we would often just say, what is it that you're concerned about? And it wasn't the standard, so. I'm going to get back to the accountability issue and the accountability of opposition. So if you're mm -hmm. really pushing, pushing back against testing, okay, well, what kind of test would you use to know how, the, how well the kids are doing? Or how, what would you suggest we use to measure teacher effectiveness if you don't want to use you know, a certain percentage of the state test? OK, what do you propose? And often, when you ask that question, there's no answer. I think one of the things that I think I see working in a, quali like a qualified way for that is like, it's almost like changing the argument. Like, I mean, one of the, the big things about it is like, some of this stuff is just going to jerk teachers around. So much, and I think there's a lot of like, there's a. I think it's really hard to push back against that argument if you can't be specific about what within the content is different. You're just like, I don't want this thing, right? But and you can't articulate it. But then, at, but then if you add the argument to like, you know, if you add teacher voice to the argument that says we did all this stuff, we did, and and we think this is good. We don't think everything about it's perfect. If we don't love the test. Sentiment that teachers have, but like it feels to me like those sort of arguments, because they're practical and they're coming from teachers who are, that's a lot of voters and a lot of people are connected to voters. And I, I just have one final comment on that, and it kind of leads us into the future because we've been talking about the past. Mm -hmm. with, with ESSA, um, you know, especially as we think about the non-academic standard, the non-academic indicators mm -hmm. that every state has to put in, I think that's where we need to be extremely careful as to what we put in because it could, that non-academic indicator could lead us to have these same type of discussions and it could completely send us off on a different path yeah. in the discussion because ESSA, it really does give us great opportunities. Um, and responsibilities, but that non-academic standard and one that's been kind of kind of popular in a lot of mm -hmm. states is the social emotional mm -hmm. measure. Mm -hmm. I, 
I was around in the in the 80s. I started my teaching career in the 80s, and we talked about confidence-based education. And I, I yep. never had such backlash as anything with that. And so we need to be, we need to really think about these lessons learned, especially around that one little piece that every state asks for. Give us something that's not tied around the test that we can use as a measure. What's that going to be? Will it hold water? Does it really make a difference? What is that one going to be? So yeah. just, yeah. you know, as we think Are forward. you imagining, like, you know, if you do student surveys, like a real concern about having that data? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, it, totally. it, it, that's one thing I asked Nate before he left. I said, I need, I need to talk to you about what you're going to do on that non-academic one because it's, uh, I think it, it, it could be our trouble spot. Yeah. Yeah. It, it could also be our best thing that ever happened. Great. Yeah. One last comment. Uh, somebody mentioned that the Common Core has changed the future and we think we're going to do this with some trust out there. Okay. So, uh, I mean, we, can, we just have to consider that in our communication. And I don't think social media helps us at all here as we run along because when I talk to people and I said, well, what is it about Common Core? You know, I said, well, I've studied it. Where do you study it? On Facebook, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Many you do, but it's and that became the gospel, and that's what everybody. Said. So they didn't trust anything anybody was telling them. So it's really, it's made everything difficult going forward. You've got different initials for things that people are going to say. That's right. just like you said. Yeah. That's common core right. coming at us from a different direction. So and the other thing is that there are 29 new chiefs in the state in, in the United States. 29 new chiefs that have not been through what. Uh, they don't have the battle scars, and yet they need the wisdom of the scars and those that came before. But we also need their fresh new thoughts. So there's somehow that we have to balance that in that, um, you know, how do we not make the same mistakes, especially with new faces at the table? And when you have good practices in your SBA, that's one of our concerns is, is you know, how do you work with the talk to speaking of capacity building, how do you work with an SBA to make the communication more strategic when we're measuring chiefs? Tenure in months. Now. Mm -hmm. So how do you help them put something into play that is sustainable, that rests in the SBA and your organization and in practices versus in people? Because when people leave, then the structure leaves. And yeah. Wow. Comment, you talk about the short-life term of a How they how how they get their seats on that board makes a difference, and there's about three different ways that that happens. The, the other thing we found, um, and I'm finding more so this year, is that the political structure, the governance structure of each SBA, a lot of them are very unique, and it makes a huge difference with communication. Um, sometimes it has to be very careful because you have an elected uh, superintendent, or sometimes the SBA will say, well, we don't even get to communicate about the reforms we're doing. We don't get to do any reforms. We just have to communicate about what's handed down to us on, on high. And so all of that plays in, in into what the communication as well. It's really interesting. Really interesting. Great. Well, we're coming up <coughs> on our time, but I want to give you each just a, a moment just to share any closing comments, any thoughts in particular about as we transition to ESSA or ESSA, what what would be your top tips or one tip that you would share for um, representatives that are here from state, various uh, states to, to bring back to their states? You know, where do we start? What is the, the best place to begin in terms of communications around this, this shift? I would say two things. And so it looks at what are the opportunities and then one of the things we need to be careful about. I think because there is a lot, there is a lot more flexibility in certain areas, I think taking that opportunity to be very innovative and thinking about um, what you could do for kids is important. And the way to get at that is to really get into the field and then make sure that the policies don't, don't block those innovations. But two is that when you think about flexibility, you think about making sure that 
that who gets in power is able to actually leverage those opportunities instead of become um, an obstacle to those opportunities because of some type of political um, opinion. Uh, mine would be um, thinking about with that that you're you're going to be implementing some new policies. You're going to be writing new policies and implementing those. That policy must have evidence. Policy without evidence is very dangerous, and we've seen that happen before. So what evidence do you have or do you expect to have that that policy is going to make a difference for student learning? And it really is all about student learning. And, and so what, how is that going to make us better? How is that going to make us, if you think of Nate's example with Tennessee, um, with more more students leaving high school with a certificate or going on to post-secondary education, um, uh, how's that going to benefit us? So uh, policy with evidence, not policy without evidence. I think the last the thing that I would say is really, I think, um, you know, I think ESSA, the headline has been, you know, it, um, changes things, returns power to states, and you know, gives issues flexibility. But I think about around one particular issue, I don't think that it's going to solve, I think it's wrong to say, oh, thank goodness, AYP and NCLB are gone. <laughs> and I think that's Absolutely. a really big temptation, mm -hmm. because I actually think, so one, I think most people clearly agree that NCLB highlighted some really important things about our system. So I think it is now, the AYP is not the only way to hold schools accountable for the performance of subgroups, but it's really important that state systems continue to do that in a very real way. And then I also think there, because the testing requirements are virtually identical to NCLB, that some of the nagging problems that we've had with assessment, and I'm a person who supports assessments fully, but some of the, you know, the outsized influence on testing in schools, that's not going to solve itself immediately. That's, that's still something to be worked on. So, you know, so the states that are looking at, you know, how many assessments are given, how much time students are spending, that work is fantastic work that needs to continue, and it's not going to go away just because of the ESSA. Thank you. I'd like to thank each of our panelists for joining us today. This was an excellent session, and I have, we all have lots of ideas to take back and you know, work in our space and, and think about where, where we go next. And so we'd love to continue this conversation. This, this shouldn't be our only one, but as we move deeper into the work, we'd love to connect back with you all and share, share what we're doing in these areas. So thank you very much. And for those who are listening in to the recording, because I think we, we lost some of our webinar participants right when we put up the wrap-up slide, so. <laughs> <laughs> but um, feel free to uh, send us any questions you have or any follow-up, and we'd be happy to support you as you're thinking about communications in your state. And you'll also be receiving an email from us with an, a link for an evaluation. We'd love your thoughts. Um, on this session as well as how it was useful to you in your in your practice. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining. We'll talk with you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.